Um, I want to thank you all for uh, inviting me here today. I had one presentation planned, but then I was told that there were going to be some poets in the audience. So I decided that uh, uh, a more general presentation that lacked in that technology would probably be more appropriate. So, uh, and in fact, I was encouraged to talk about electric vehicles. So that's what I'm going to talk about today is electric vehicles, uh, where we are, where we're going, uh, where we're not going. Uh, EVs are an interesting topic because everybody's got an opinion about electric vehicles. You either like them, you don't like them, you love them, you hate them. Uh, you think they're good for the environment, you think they're bad for the environment, so forth. So it's a, it's a very interesting uh, topic. Um, yeah, so um, our agenda for the talk is to talk first about, you know, why EVs? Why do people like them? Why do people not like them? Um, there's the hybrids, which we'll discuss very briefly. Uh, you know, what's going on with the market? Battery, which is a big challenge. We'll talk a little bit about that. Um, one of the big challenges is charging, what's happening there and so forth. We'll talk a little bit about technology, not a whole lot, um, and some of the environmental issues. And then uh, what I want to do is show you what in 2018 were the manufacturer's plans for electric vehicles in their lineups. And the reason I want to do that is because we can take a look at what they thought in 2018 and we can see where they are today. Right? And then um, I want to just review the NRC report uh, that I chaired uh, back in 2015 and we'll take a look at what the recommendations were in that report and whether any of those recommendations were in fact followed by the government. <clears throat> so uh, I've got two charts here about the reasons why people like EVs and why they don't like EVs. So it's important to understand that um, there are some dominant reasons for both. Both of them generally involve money. First of all, um, the reasons for purchasing an EV, major reason being almost half of the people said it was to save money on gas. And then those who wanted to purchase an EV also had kind of an environmental concern and save money on vehicle maintenance. That's an interesting one because a lot of people don't understand the difference on maintenance between a gasoline engine and an electric vehicle. And then there are, there are a few other uh, reasons in there, like the tax break um, and so forth. So that's the reasons why people might buy an EV, and here are the reasons why they might not. Cost, number one, absolutely. Um, it, it's always been a problem. Um, we'll see in a moment why that cost has impacted where we are today with EV sales. Uh, charging stations, big issue. Uh, there's a perception that you need charging stations everywhere. Many of those people who own an EV say that's not really necessary. And the battery. So those are the three big issues. The battery, of course, is, uh, is related to the range of the vehicle. So just a very brief discussion, a uh, description of the um, hybrid vehicle versus the electric, fully electric vehicle. In the case of the hybrid, what we've got is a gasoline engine as well as an electric drive. And there are various configurations. This is just one that, that I've shown up here. Um, between, <coughs> that link the electrical system and the mechanical, uh, the mechanical uh, traction system. And the benefit is that you can put in a smaller internal combustion engine. You can operate that engine at a at a point that's, that's uh, at its maximum efficiency. A lot of the time, you can use the electric motor uh, for fast acceleration, etc. There are also variations in terms of the degree of electrification of the vehicle. Toyota was one of the, was the first one, actually, to actually put a, a hybrid on the road. And the first one they put on the road was called a mild hybrid. And all it really did was provide um, the ability to stop the car and turn off the engine 
and then start the car with a little bit of electric juice. Um, Toyota, by the way, as we'll see, has never really thought that electric vehicles were practical. They are the dominant manufacturer of hybrid vehicles today. They manufacture almost no fully electric vehicles. So the electric vehicle is a much simpler, uh, much simpler drive train. You've got a battery, you've got a, a, an inverter that takes the battery, converts it into three phase AC at variable frequency, drives the motor, different kinds of motors, we'll see that in a minute. There's a gearbox and then bang, uh, you're at the differential and you, you, you're driving. So what's the market doing? Well, uh, here are the dominant electric vehicles today. And you see that Toyota does not appear on that because Toyota does not make electric vehicles in sufficient quantity to even make a, a mark on this chart. And of course, Tesla by far is, is the dominant um, manufacturer. You know, can't really see this thing. Um, you see that Ford uh, has the Mach-E, the Ford also has the F-150 Lightning, which they've discontinued for the moment. Um, but there's a you can see that almost every major manufacturer has some electric vehicles. US. The big part US. US. This is yes, this is market, US market. Um, and here's quarter one twenty-four in the percent of EVs sold by individual manufacturers. So within their product line, you see, I don't know if you can read it, um, but uh, Cadillac is surprisingly dominant. 16% of their sales were electric vehicles. I didn't know that until I found this graph. Um, Mercedes, again, I was surprised to see that that many. Of course, um, there's 100% in among the major, well, not the major, but what they call 100% close, Fisker, Lucid, Polestar, Rivian, and of course, Tesla, which makes only electric vehicles, uh, and VinFast, I, I never even heard of VinFast, the others I've heard of. So it gives you some idea of uh, how the progression has been among different manufacturers. And you see, here's Toyota, four tenths of a percent of their vehicles are electric. And they have been very, very, uh, very, very um, secure in their position that TVs don't make sense, that it is the hybrid vehicle that makes sense. They may be right. Uh, so here we have, again, this is vehicle sales between hybrids and electric vehicles. So the blue lines are e fully electric vehicles. The orange lines are hybrids. Now, the interesting, the interesting point to this graph is that in 2024, the number of EVs has dropped. And there's a lot of concern about that. Certainly, it has screwed up a lot of manufacturers' plans, as you will see in a moment. Uh, and the hybrids, you see, dominate uh, the, uh, the sales. And again, a lot of the hybrids are predominantly Toyotas. Does anybody here uh, have an electric vehicle? Who, who drives an EV? What kind of EV do you drive? Tesla. Tesla? Which model? Y. Model Y. It's a big selling one. Who else has an EV? Anybody have a hybrid? What hybrid do you have? Prius. Prius. I'm surprised that there are so few hybrids. You have a hybrid, what do you drive? Prius. 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 Anybody else? What do you drive? No. <laughs> you got good mileage for the Prius? Yeah. Um, Okay, so let's talk about the battery. 
Um, this is a very important part of both an EV and a hybrid, actually. Right? So, of course, in the electric vehicle, it determines how far you can go. So um, I have a little uh, video here that it talks about how you install the batteries into an electric vehicle. Of the planes. Oh, we need we need audio. Um, Oh, we might find the audio here. So, right. Is there some way that we can turn my microphone off? No, no, no. So, Battery, 
Yeah. Um, so uh, <clears throat> here we have. A lead acid battery, um, which is a standard SLI battery starting lighting ignition. Nickel metal hydride, which was the first battery chemistry that was put into the Prius originally. And it didn't last very long. Then they went to the lithium, various lithium uh, cathodes. Um, the ones that are that are used today are the the um, uh, NMC. The lithium manganese cobalt, uh, nickel manganese cobalt chemistry, which has a, a, a you know the, one of the important one of the important parameters is the thermal runaway parameter. So it's two hundred and ten, which is very very good. Uh, lithium iron phosphate. This one is becoming more popular because of its safety. You know, the, the fires in the Teslas, uh, fires in computers and some other apparatus has, has been a major concern. But the lithium iron phosphate, while it doesn't have the same capacity, energy capacity as the others do, um, is nevertheless a, a safer choice because of the fact that its thermal runaway temperature is much higher and it doesn't have quite the same problems with, with uh, fire. Uh, just as a short aside, um, regarding the lead acid battery, one of the things that I, as a, I, I tell any class that I teach when we've got, you know, there's a little bit of time, I say, how many of you routinely change the battery in your car? How many of you routinely change the battery in your car, never mind the hybrids, but how many do you routinely? Every couple of years, huh? a couple of five year battery. You change it, when do you change it? Every four years. You do, bravo for you, <laughs> is what I tell you. What I tell my students is that the battery is a routine maintenance item. Now I tell them that, and unfortunately, I don't ascribe to that myself. So I always wind up stuck somewhere <laughs> when my battery goes dead and I have to call AAA. But the battery should, it should be a uh, routine maintenance item. You know, when you're running up against the, the, the five year warranty or whatever it is, get that battery changed because as sure as God made little green apples, that battery is gonna fail as soon as you get to five years. The battery manufacturers have tailored the manufacturing so that that happens. So uh, for those of you who don't know about the lithium ion battery, it basically has a, the, the, the chemistry, the important chemistry is located at the cathode. This is where all the action takes place. The anode is uh, of course carbon uh, plate. Right? So the different, the different chemistries all relate to what's in the cathode. So there's a lot of attention in, in the research on battery chemistries on different cathode materials. Now, people are investigating uh, nanoparticle cathodes, people are investigating uh, other kinds of alloys in the cathodes to try and boost uh, the energy density um, of, the, of the battery. And uh, you know, it's a very slow process. So uh, the other problem with the battery, of course, is that when it's cold or very hot outside and you've got the air conditioner or heater on, you lose capacity, <coughs> I mean, you lose range, is what you lose. So um, in the case of the BMW, you know, you lose 50% when you're at 20 degrees F by driving in the winter and you've got the heater on. Um, some of the, the Tesla Model S loses 35, 38%. And, and in the summer, when you've got the AC on, you don't lose quite as much. But the fact is that uh, when you talk about range, you've got to talk about 
what happens when you're driving your car in some of these extreme situations. Now here in California, where you are, you don't have to worry about the winter. In Boston, where I am, we have to worry about the winter. Some people who live in Canada have to worry even more about the winter. So when you look at where these cars are sold, a lot of them are sold in places where you don't have to worry about, about the winter, which is where you get the worst uh, degradation of range. So uh, you saw all those cells being dumped out of the, 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 the uh, Mercedes. The cells in the, in the, uh, in the Teslas are, are what are known as 18650 cells. That, that number relates to the, to the physical dimension of the cell. And each cell has to be protected against overcharging, overheating, et cetera. So each cell, in fact, has an electronic adapter on it, not an adapter, but a, a, an adjunct to the cell that monitors each cell, which is one of the reasons why the battery is so expensive. So let's talk about charging. Professor. Uh, excuse me, Professor. Yeah. Could you uh, talk about the uh, manufacturing of the batteries? Is it able to be... Can they all be made in America or are they made overseas? What are those challenges? Yeah, yeah. No, that's a very good question. And I'm afraid, I, you know, there's been a lot of, of talk about new battery plants being, being built in, in the U.S. and new battery plants being built in China and so forth. And I'm not sure what the status of all of those is. Certainly, Tesla has a giga battery plant in, in, here in California, right? So, yeah. Nevada. 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 Yeah, I knew it was you know, from the East Coast, Nevada and California looked like one of the places. <laughs> um, but I, uh, the, the government has been trying to force, as I'll show you in a minute, force manufacturers to incorporate more made in America stuff in the electric vehicle. And that battery is certainly one of those things. Um, unfortunately, you know, the, the, the problem with the battery is not just how you manufacture it. It's where you get all the raw materials that go into it, especially cobalt for the NMC uh, material, NMC chemistry. So um, it's a good question, and I don't have a, a firm answer for you, but it's one that's been bothering a lot of government officials. So um, there, are, <clears throat> there are three charging protocols that, uh, that are used in the US. There's AC level one, which is where you just plug it into the wall. And you can get up to, uh, you know, level one is basically 120 volts. It's your normal, you know, whatever you've got available. Um, but you can only get almost no more than two kilowatts. Uh, there's AC level two, where you, you run a, a much more, um, a much heavier line, 240 volts, like you would use, for example, for an electric stove or an air conditioner or something like that. So you can get much more. So you can get almost 20 kilowatts if, you're, if you've got an 80 amp here. Line. Now that requires you to install um, service equipment in your garage or wherever you're charging. So it's an expense. Uh, then there's DC fast charging, which is, um, you know, it's what everyone would like to use. It's what you would need if you're on the road and you want to charge your car at a public or a Tesla charging station. You don't want to wait 12 hours like you would in the level two situation to charge the car. You want to charge it more quickly. So um, the DC fast charging uses DC into the car. The car recognizes that. And it can charge anywhere from, well, Tesla uh, typically is 140 kilowatts, but um, I guess there are new, nobody has a, did anyone have a, you got a Tesla. Yeah. 
it, it, can you charge uh, two hundred fifty? The newer, the newer ones, the Gen three ones, the yeah, it's been yeah, you can try. But that's a peak current when you first start with a low battery. It, it, it tapers off. Yes, well, they all do. They all will taper off. They have to. Um, so you can ch test will charge up to two hundred fifty kilowatts. Then, right? Um, some public chargers will go up to three hundred fifty kilowatts. And there's a proposal uh, from Japan uh, to go to nine hundred kilowatts. The problem here. If it is a problem, um, let me rephrase that. The question that has not yet been answered is what does super fast charging do to the life of the battery? Because I don't know if you noticed on the <clears throat> chart of the different battery chemistries, the charge rate for all of the testing was identified as 1C. Does anyone know what that means? Yeah, I know you know what that means. <laughs> 1C means it's being charged at the capacity of the battery. So if you've got a battery that's, let's say, 45 kilowatt hours, the 1C charge rate is 45 kilowatts. So nobody's got a 900 kilowatt hour battery in their car yet. So the question is, okay, if I'm charging, you know, for 350 kilowatts, nobody's got a 350 kilowatt hour battery. Your bat what size battery do you have in your car? I believe I have, a, I have an older Model 3, like a 2018, a real early one. I want to I think it's like 70. 70 kilowatt hours? Mm -hmm. That's a pretty good size battery. What kind of range do you get? Oh, uh, it was new when that car was new. It was three hundred and ten miles. I got about sixty-seven thousand miles on it now. It gets around like two ninety, I think now. I see. Like that. It's pretty good. Yeah. yeah. So that's still an open question: is what do these high charge rates from the DC charger do to the to the life of the battery? Do you mind if they something um, complicated? Why is that? Excuse me? What, why is that? Why does the high charge rate degrade the battery? Because it's just uh, physics. Or can it, it's it's it? two, two things. Number one, it heats things up more than normal. And number two, uh, with the high currents in there, there's a lot of mechanical. I mean, you've got, you've got forces mm. that, that occur within the battery that can degrade the, the plate there. I'm, I'm not a battery. As expert, so I'm sure there are other mechanisms that also degrade the battery. There's so much stuff going on in the battery, but we need as a chemical engineer here. Yeah. Is there public data on that, like on the degradation? Not as far as I know. Nobody, nobody has it on the road. <laughs> yeah. Nobody what? Have it on the road, like those very like high, high capacity batteries. Uh, well, the 900 kilowatt hour is not on the road around here, but. Um, the public charge is 50 kilowatts. But there are a lot of Uber drivers and, and other and that are driving those and hitting the fast chargers pretty regularly. Yeah. I'm 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 sure that Tesla must be doing some data gathering, right? Because every time you plug into a Tesla charger, they know who you are, where you are, how much charge you're getting, and what it's going to cost you. Are you still getting free charge? I know. Actually, I should get it. I did a referral. I got free charging now for a while. I see. <laughs> Good for you. Okay. Um, so, uh, regarding the protocols, as I just mentioned, there's got to be communication between the charger and the car. The charger has to know how big the battery is. The charger has to know how much charge the battery needs. It has to know how fast it can charge. Etc. Um, the uh, communication is done with one of two protocols, either CAN or PLC. Uh, CAN is a controlled area network that's very common in cars, CAN bus. Uh, PLC is a programmable logic controller um, is used in uh, for CCS. Uh, the CHATMO and CCS refer to the connectors. Um, so connector has to provide the communication connection, and uh, here are 
One of the problems with EVs that's slowly being solved, and that is that there's no uniform, uniform standard of a connector for everybody. So we've got Chanamo, which is a Japanese um, design. Uh, I've got down there what the, the, the Chatamo, uh, some people say that Chatamo derives from charge the motion, French. There's a Japanese expression, ocha de mo ikaga de suka. How about some tea? I don't know how that relates to the connector, but that's the one on the left. The CCS, which is um, a standard that was uh, developed by the SAE, and uh, it originally was the J1772, which did not have the HVDC, the, high, the, the um, fast DC charging uh, connection. The two lower, these, these two things here, this is the DC charging. This would be level one, level two. Right? And Tesla had its own proprietary charging connector. And uh, <coughs> EU for a while had a Medicaid connector. I don't think that's, that's in any way used today. In any event, most of the US electric vehicles use the CCS uh, connector. And now that uh, in order for Tesla to get to uh, get funding from the government, they have to be able to provide access to their chargers for everybody. And so there are adapters now that will allow you to charge some cars anyway from the uh, Tesla chargers, which is of course ubiquitous. Here's another problem. Suppose you live in an apartment. How do you charge your car? Well, in general, you don't. Because you can't, you're generally not allowed by the apartment complex owner or manager or whatever to put in a charger yourself. And although there's, uh, there are building codes that are trying to force the introduction of charging ports in multi-unit dwellings, uh, I, I don't know how successful that has been. I've got a chart that shows you something about it uh, that I'll show in a moment. Uh, it, it, some utilities are providing some incentives. Uh, PG&E, which is your local, right, pg and &E, uh, they have incentives that they will install chargers in priority communities. A priority community or I'm sure you all know what a priority community is, right? It's a, it's a you know, community that is uh, not very well off. And uh, so PG&E is trying to, to encourage um, the adoption of electric vehicles in those, those communities. So here's public charging. Um, the top blue bars are the DC fast chargers. And the uh, green bars are uh, level two. You don't even see level one on there at all. So you can see that there's been a growth, in, 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 but from 2019 to 2023, the growth is, I would consider it modest. And that's what everybody has been complaining about is that especially the DC fast chargers aren't getting installed in the, at, at the rate that, the, that people want. They're not getting installed in the places people want. And a lot of complaints have, have been raised about the fact that the chargers that are installed don't work. I don't know, but you're the only one who's kind of got a fully electric vehicle and you use Tesla chargers and they work. I've been driving fully electric since 2016 for the most part. What's I've been that? driving fully electric since 2016 for the most part. Oh, yeah? I had a Nissan Leaf for two years. Oh. I had an early Tesla Model 3. The Tesla chargers always work. Yeah. Did um, you run into chargers that didn't work? With people before, yeah. With, they're, they're, they're definitely, it's, it's improving rapidly. They, yeah. They yeah. Really, yes. Yeah. Um, we'll talk a little, uh, just briefly a little more about that when we get to the end of the, my talk. Uh, so here's what's happening with DC fast chargers. And... Uh, you can see 
that uh, the the brown bars are uh, the 250 to 349k kilowatt uh, chargers, and the black bar is greater than 349 kilowatts. So th there's certainly been a growth uh, in those uh, fast chargers, which of course is absolutely necessary for uh, the further adoption of EVs. Um, this is just a chart of you know what companies are actually providing uh, charging DC fast charging for the green. Guess who the green is? Who's the green? Right. Anyone can read, right? <laughs> if you can see the colors, green is Tesla. And Tesla's got their chargers all over the place. Um, some of the others. Uh, this is. Um, where's Electrify? Yeah, Electrify America. This is that that's a result of the um, settlement with Volkswagen. You know, there's a big settlement because of the Volkswagen uh, diesel scam, uh, and that put, it was designed to put in fast chargers. So I mentioned a little earlier the. Uh, the fact that workplace charging is something that the government was trying to support. But you see here, workplace charging uh, only got, it was growing until 2021, and then it just flattened out. Now, I'm not sure why, but uh, could be that people stopped buying electric vehicles uh, for a lot of companies, or that the cost of installing those chargers just wasn't worth it. But in any event, the workplace charging uh, has died off. Does Stanford have chargers? Mm -hmm. yeah. How far away? Stanford's a big place, I discovered. How far away from every place is it? Are they scattered around or? Most garages, wherever you can park the car. But you get free parking when you go there, right? Um, one of the incentives is that you go to some of these parking garages. I know at the uh, hospital parking garages, they have about half a dozen charging stations. They're always empty, but you can't go in there unless you've got an EV. Uh, okay. It's a multi-unit dwelling house. Uh, this is again, you can see that there's some increase in uh, the introduction of charge ports in multi-unit dwellings. Uh, that's, uh, I don't know how much of that is California due to the PG&E incentives. Now, uh, Tesla used to give every one of their owners, Tesla owners, free charging. Um, I think it started out for life, right? No, 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 with Model 3, with Model S, yeah. You bought a Model S, you see that one? About what? You bought a Model S. Or the the Model, Model S. Or, they don't do that, they don't do that for a long time. Yeah. All right. Well, anyway, um, it was free for a while. So this gives you an idea of what it costs to charge. Uh, this is 35 cents a kilowatt hour. All right. So that translates into about uh, that that's about a mile because it well, let me think of a way to let me get my math right. Uh, no, yes, because it, it it's a it takes about a third of a kilowatt hour per mile for a car, the energy required for a car to move. So that will that will be uh, sort of like one month, thirty four cents a month. So if you if you tally that up, um, yes, depending on gas price, that could be uh, a good deal. Certainly here, where I was just horrified yesterday to see that the price of gasoline was five. I saw it here on on on, on the. Uh, 
Real. El Camino, El Camino Real. El Camino Real. $5.60 for gas, a gallon of gasoline. I mean, that's almost $2.25 more than what I pay, and I thought I was paying a lot. Uh, so uh, you can do the math, but that's typically what, what you're going to be charged. And you also better be there to get your car out of the charger, otherwise you're going to be charged for as it says, a dollar a minute after your charge is done. Right? Have you run into this? Yeah, I mean, it tells you under app though. Normally, yeah. I mean, I only use fast chargers once in a blue moon. I'm traveling like interstate. Yeah. I've driven like from Maryland to Florida a couple times, you know, Illinois. Really? From here to Florida? Uh, from Maryland to Florida. Oh, from Maryland to Florida. That's right, I live in Maryland. Oh, I see. What are you doing here? I'm sorry. I'm I didn't really this paper. Paper. <laughs> <laughs> you have an old friend. <laughs> I see. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Three years ago. Uh, <laughs> nice. uh, anyway, that, that, that actually is a slide from quite a few years ago. So I don't know what the deal is now, but it's comparable, I'm sure. Something similar. Um, and, and if you want to know what the cost of electricity is, here are some just a few states. You see, Massachusetts is uh, sort of like uh, 32 something cents a kilowatt hour. Um, someplace like Washington, the state of Washington, it's pr practically nothing. I mean, very, very cheap when you get all that hydro. It's also very uh, environmentally friendly. So let's talk a little bit about some technology. Uh, here are two kinds of motors that are used in, in electric vehicles. Um, the early Nissan Leaf used uh, the one on the left, which is a, an inter what's known as an interior permanent magnet machine. These are magnets. All these white things are magnets. Um, it's a machine that's expensive to manufacture. It's very high performance. Over here is an induction machine, much less expensive to manufacture, a little bit less uh, in terms of performance. Uh, this one has copper bars. Normally, um, an induction machine today, if you buy one to your, your home shop or something, would have aluminum bars in there. But the copper bars, because of the fact that their conductivity is much better than aluminum, makes that machine more efficient than uh, the conventional uh, induction machine. But I believe, you know, sometimes it's hard to get data, but I believe that Tesla is now using induction machines. They originally used um, the internal. The, the Model um, S's used induction motors. The newer Model 3's are using uh, variable or uh, reluctance motors. They are they're, uh -huh. they're reluctance motors. Oh, is that right? They, they, they do yeah. some permanent magnets. I should have put that up there too. Reluctance motor is a little different. Um, it's got salient poles. Uh, anyway, we won't get into that. So there are two kinds of motors here, plus the reluctance motor. Um, here's a, a, the Model S uh, chassis. And uh, just to give you some idea of how they manufacture these things. So uh, this is a single motor integrated uh, motor, motor and gearbox. On the axle, so it's an integrated axle along with the with the with the gearing, and this pallet here is where all the batteries are. Um, this is uh, the inverter. Um, I show this because this is power electronics. It's all electronics in here, but. The real challenge is the packaging. How do you package this stuff in a way that gets the heat out and is small and is manufacturable? So you can see this is, this is a pretty complex system of thermal management plus electronics plus mechanical structure. And it has to be compatible with uh, you know, you can see over here, this is the, uh, the connection to the, 
the transmission to the gearbox. This also uses uh, silicon carbide uh, MOSFETs. The silicon carbide uh, is a semiconductor material that in the last 10 years has become <coughs> commercially available. It's got a lot of features that are superior to what silicon has. And in particular, let me just point out here um, two. First of all, the uh, electron saturation velocity, that might not, might not mean a whole lot to a lot of you, but it has to do with how well it will conduct under condi conditions of high current, right? Is uh, more than two times what silicon is. But the big challenge, the big advantage is the thermal conductivity, which is three times, more than three times what the thermal conductivity uh, of silicon is. So it's a great material for building the kind of things that go into electric vehicles. And now I believe almost all the manufacturers are using silicon carbide. And if they're not, they're behind the times. So what about financial incentives? Well, there's a federal tax credit, um, actually it's now a rebate of up to $7,500, but it, it depends. Again, we were talking earlier about what's inside the battery. And if you have only 40% of domestic materials in the battery, then you only get 3750. If you have more than 50%, you get the full 7500. So still you're allowed to get stuff from overseas, obviously. Um, but only four vehicles currently qualify. Unfortunately, one of them is the Ford 150 Lightning, um, which for the moment Ford is not manufacturing because they shut down that plant uh, for uh, a while. But the Teslas uh, qualify. And of course, they're state incentives. And I, you know, they, I can't give you a list of them because I don't know. But California, I'm sure, has some incentives in addition to the federal incentives. Uh, oh, yeah, this is related to, you know, how, how, uh, <laughs> environmentally good is your fuel is your you know who wh where is your electricity coming from uh, so you see here I mentioned Washington look at <clears throat> Washington over 80 percent of the electricity in Washington comes from hydro the same thing with Norway and and uh, Norway is I, think, I don't have the, the charts here for those um, but uh, these, France, Germany, and the Netherlands, they, there's something in the vicinity of um, 30 or so percent. Norway is almost 100 percent like Washington is because Norway and Sweden have tremendous hydro uh, capacities. Um, so here's when I mentioned, you know, what were the plans back in 2018, you can see that they were very, very aggressive. Mercedes expected to be all electric by 2022. Clearly that didn't happen. In spite of the video that I showed you, they didn't sell very many of those. <laughs> um, Volkswagen did in fact build an assembly plant in Tennessee. I don't know whether they're making EVs in that plant. They certainly haven't sold a million EVs or anything close to it yet. Uh, I don't know what's happened to the rest of these, but you don't hear much about it. There are additional plans. GM was going to invest 300 million in Orion. That's the plant that got shut down a year ago. Um, Dyson, haven't heard squat about Dyson. I don't think they're in the business at all. Um, don't know whether FedEx got their Changi electric vans. Um, and car manufacturing mandates 100%. And 
and the buses by 2040. Does anyone know how close CARB is to that? They're not? I would doubt it. But there are manufacturers of electric buses. This is what I just mentioned about um, the Orion assembly plant. They, they shut it down. I'm sorry, because if I were going to buy an electric vehicle, what I really wanted was that F 150 truck, which is apparently a beautiful, beautiful truck. Um, it's also, I read a review, it's an extremely comfortable ride. It's got a, a power adapter on it. You can power all sorts of other stuff. From the battery and so forth, but they're going to re uh, they're going to restart it. Um, I don't know next year maybe. Okay. Uh, oh, this <laughs> this is just a fun car. Uh, this is not an electric vehicle. <laughs> <laughs> this is a Bugatti. I came across this. Fifteen hundred horsepower. Eighteen million dollars, if you want one. But this one is sold. So I guess if you want one, you're going to have to wait. All right, so let's spend a couple minutes on, on this report. This is the report of the National Research Council study that, that I chaired back in 2015. And, this, and the study had a number of recommendations, and we're just going to go quickly through some of those recommendations and see where we are today. First, we recommended that the tax credit should be changed to a rebate. Yes, that's what's happened. States should assure compatibility of chargers and plugs and payment. It hasn't happened yet, but the plugs are becoming standard, but not because of anything that states have done. The payment systems, I think, are still uh, in flux. The feds should use ad accounts to educate consumers, never done. Feds should support battery research. Yes, the feds are supporting a lot of battery research. This is the next one, road tax, is an interesting one because electric vehicles don't pay a road tax. When you buy your $5.60 gallon of gasoline, some fraction of that is going into maintaining the roads. The EV drivers don't pay that. Uh, we recommended that it should be exempted for a transition period, but the transition period seems to be infinite, at least at this point. And there are a number of other uh, recommendations, some of which have been, uh, have been taken to heart, others have not. The last one is a, is a um, this is a conclusion that we could not find a business case for private investment in charging infrastructures. That for sure has been borne out. There is no private investment in the infrastructure. There is private investment in the manufacture of the chargers, but that's different from investing in mounting and maintaining and servicing a charger system. There is no, no, uh, private investment for that. Uh, this is the uh, website for that report. If any of you are interested in, in looking at it, um, and if you just send me an email and I'll send you a link to the report if you want it. Um, and there are two unresolved issues. Uh, I'm just gonna mention them. I don't know what the, what the status is. Um, a fee, there's got to be a fee, fee substitute for the road tax. Otherwise, there's no, no funding to maintain the roads in the country. And there's a question if we really, if EVs really proliferate, is there going to be a requirement that some changes occur on the grid? And that, that last one is nobody can agree because nobody can agree on how fast electric vehicle adoption is going to occur and so forth. Um, but there's a lot of thought being given to it, papers being written and so forth. Um, anyway, uh, that is the end of my talk. So I'd be happy to discuss any issue, answer any questions. <laughs>